God, we come this morning to offer the word that you have given to our hearts to bring hope to us, Father, concerning the last few days as we have lost a son, a grandson, and a great-grandson. And I pray, God, that you would give me the strength and the courage to speak your word. I pray, God, that it would go forth into our hearts with hope, assurance, and encouragement, and with the love and the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And thank you for the opportunity, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to preach on this subject, finding hope in the passing of my great-grandson. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, Paul the Apostle said to the church at Corinth, For now we see through a glass, darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as also I am known. We don't understand everything that happens to us. Life sometimes is full of disappointments and question marks. We think as Christians that this should not be happening to us because we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We feel that we should be immune to life's setbacks and disappointments. Such seasons in life leave us crying for answers and understanding. The truth of the matter is sometimes life does not turn out the way we expect it. Perhaps a dream, a particular situation or circumstance in employment a marriage, where you live, a sickness, and sometimes a death. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12, in the easy version, it says this. We don't yet see things clearly. We're squinting in a fog, peering through a mist. But it won't be long before the weather clears and the sun shines bright. We'll see it all then. Amen. See it all as clearly as God sees us, knowing him directly just as he knows us. What was Paul saying? We will see God face to face. We will see each other face to face. And many of the questions that we have will be answered. We look through a glass darkly. We don't see everything that we would like to see. We don't have all the answers to the questions that we have this morning. But eventually, God says we will see him face to face. Amen. And the questions and the answers will be resolved. I has not seen, nor ear heard. Isaiah the prophet said these words in Isaiah 64 and verse 4. But since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither had the eye seen, O God, beside thee, what he hath prepared for him that waiteth for him. Men have looked into the future. Men have desired to know what heaven is like. Men want to know what's on the other side of that river. Men want to know when they close their eyes for the last time what it will be like. That's right. They have inquired. They have talked about it. They have written about it. They have sung about it. Isaiah chapter 64 and the verse 4 in the easy version says, Since before time began, no one has ever imagined, no ear heard, no eye seen, a God like you who works for those who wait for him try to understand God in the best way that we know how in our finite being. Right. But God is infinite. Amen. And one day we will also be eternal. This is temporal right now. And yes, it's a painful moment. Yes, as we pass through this season of sorrow and grief, it not only brings to mind the death of a son or a grandson or a great-grandson, but it stirs up all the memories that we all have concerning those that we have placed in a cemetery or visited in a funeral home. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9 says this, But as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. The easy translation of that version says this, That's why we have this scripture text. No one has ever seen or heard anything like this. Right. Never so much as imagined anything quite like it. What God has arranged for those who love him. Sometimes I think of the colors of the flowers that might be in heaven. The trees and the river. 
the great majesty of God, the throne, the angels singing, seeing from this side we can only imagine what God has prepared. We try to conceptualize in our minds and in our hearts and in our soul what it will be like. But I don't think we can fully understand what that place will be called heaven because we look through a glass darkly. We try to find answers in our sorrow, in our grief. I looked at a verse that the Lord gave to me in Job chapter 30 and verse 25. Job is crying out to God and he says, Did I not weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? What was Job saying? He was saying, God, I help people. I love people. I love my family. I sacrificed for my sons and my daughters. I was there at the bedside of my friends to help close their eyes and place them in a place where they would rest. I reached out to the poor. I reached out to the needy. I was there, God. So why? Why am I experiencing this trouble? Job was saying, did I not weep for him that was in trouble? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? Does this mean trouble and sorrow would come to us? When it occurs, does it mean that God is not active in our lives? Job was looking for an answer. He wanted to know why this happened, this devastation, the loss, the death, everything gone that God had given him. And he searched for that answer. And he answered that question in Job chapter 34 and verse 29 when he said these words. If God is silent, what's that to you? If he turns his face away, what can you do about it? Whether silent or hidden, he's there ruling. You know what Job was saying? I don't understand all of this, God. I don't understand all this death and all this devastation. And Lord, you're silent right now. But I know one thing. I know, God, you're in control. And I know, God, hallelujah, that you are in charge of my life and in my future. And I know, Lord, as I step towards you, the presence of God will fill my soul and my spirit. And God, you'll put a step in my walk and a sparkle in my eye. Oh, God, I know that you will be there. I don't understand all this right now, God, but I do know this. You are in control, and you are ruling not only my life, but the life of this entire world. Amen. Sometimes we look at grief and sorrow personally, and we think no one understands. And sometimes people don't understand exactly what you're going through because they've never experienced. I've never experienced the passing of a child from the womb. I've never experienced the heartache of a mother. I've never experienced her contractions. I've never experienced the face of a dad looking into the face of his wife as a man looking for answers, and he has none at the moment, but tears and weeping and emotion all packed in one moment that's so hard to explain and express. And you stand in awe just saying, God, please give us, oh God, direction. Give us your comfort. I can tell you this this morning by the word. I have never experienced what my granddaughter has experienced. But I can tell you this. That Isaiah the prophet said it in Isaiah 53 and verse 3. Concerning Jesus. Concerning our sorrow and our grief that we experience personally and as a family. He is despised and rejected of men. He is a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Jesus experienced this. Jesus was acquainted with grief. He was acquainted with sorrow. He walked in our shoes before we even experienced what we're experiencing this morning. God came, and through Jesus Christ dying on the cross and rising from the dead, 
Jesus said, I must go. And why did he go? He said, so that I could pray the comforter would come. That's right. Oh, do we need a comforter this morning? Oh, do we need a comforter for this world? Romans 8 and 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The easy translation says this, Meanwhile, the moment we get tired in the waiting, God's Spirit is right alongside us, along helping us. If we don't know how or what to pray, it doesn't matter. He does our praying in and for us, making prayer out of our wordless sighs and our aching groans. <laughs> Sometimes there's no words to pray. Sometimes there is no expression of words. It only comes out in sighs and in groans and in tears and in crying. Right. And God equates that with our prayers. That's what Paul was saying to the church at Rome. He says, you may not be able to pray a prayer this morning. You may not be able to un have the unction of God to stand and sing and praise your God. But God sees your tears and he sees your grief and he sees your sorrow and he sees your wordless sighs and your aching grief and he equates that as your prayers going up to him. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, God is a God of love and God is a God of comfort. And although we don't understand all that has taken place, we do know that God is in charge, praise God, of our lives this morning. What is our prayer during these times of grief and sorrow? What is our prayer? God directed me to a beautiful verse and I just tore it apart. He said in Psalm 17 and 8, Keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. We have looked at that verse many times in our lifetime. That we are the apple of God's eye. But what does that mean? I found out a little bit more of what that means yesterday. When the psalmist says, keep me. He was saying these words to God. Guard me. Amen. Guard me. I'm your prisoner. Guard me. Observe me. Look upon me, Lord, right now. Look upon me as you looked upon Job. Look upon me. When... Abraham buried Sarah. Look upon me, O oh God. As Jesus went to the tomb and wept, look upon me, O oh God. When his sisters were weeping, look upon me, O oh God. He's saying, keep me, which means to give heed to me. Have charge of my life right now. Keep watch like someone guarding a prisoner, God. You see, God is our watchman. God watches over us. And God doesn't need a high tower, hallelujah, to look out from. But he sees our every move. He knows our every breath. He knows our direction. He knows our every step. That's right. Because he is our watchman. The psalmist says, keep me, what, as the apple of the eye. What does that mean? It means this. Keep me, God, in the middle of the night when I'm experiencing the deepest blackness of my life. That's what it means. That's what it means. When you're laying upon your bed and you're trying to come up with an answer, come up with a reason, God says, I'll keep you as the apple of my eye. You see, because I'm guarding you and I'm watching you and I see you in the middle of the night experiencing the greatest and deepest blackness of your life. What does it mean? Keep your eye upon me, God, especially when my life is turned upside down. That's right. Keep your eye upon me, Lord, when it looks like I can't steer in the direction that you want me to go. Keep your eye upon me in my darkest moments. The psalmist continued and he says, keep me as the apple of the eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. What does it mean to hide me? It means to conceal me in that secret place that only God can put you. That's right. Amen. A mother could love you. A dad can hug you. A grandparent 
can comfort you. But there's only one person, praise God, that can hide you in that secret place that's so sacred and so secret and so divine. Only God can hold you to his bosom in that place. No one else can because God has experienced what you have experienced yourself. And then he said these words, hide me where? Under the shadow of thy wings. What does the word shadow mean? It means in the shade of your defense. Hide me. Guard me as your prisoner. Don't let anything touch me, God. I've been hurt. I'm in pain. I'm crying out in my grief and my sorrow. Surround me as the guardsmen and watchmen of my life. And then this word. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. What does that mean? It means this. Under the skirt of your garment. It means to be put or thrust into a corner and be hidden from view. Do you remember the lady in the book of Mark chapter 5? That's right. She touched the hem of his garment. They said in the Old Testament that there's healing in his wings. And what's God saying? God is saying, come under the skirt of my garment and touch the hem of my garment so that I can thrust you into a corner and keep my eye upon you and keep you hidden from view and bring you close to my bosom to soothe you and comfort you and encourage you in your most darkest hour. That's right. That's what it means. Keep it. What's our prayer? Our prayer during this time should be, keep me as the apple of thy eye, Lord, and hide me under the shadow of thy wings. But it doesn't end there. The Bible says in Psalm 69 and verse 17, hide not thy face from thy servant, for I am in trouble. Hear me speedily. Psalm 27 and verse 5 reads, for in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. Amen. Psalm 31 and 7 reads, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy. For thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. Psalm 31 and verse 9, Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eye is consumed with grief. Yea, my soul and my belly. Psalm 32 and verse 7 reads, Thou art my hiding place. Thou shalt preserve me from trouble. Thou shalt compass me about with the songs of deliverance. And the psalmist said in Psalm 37 and verse 39, But the salvation of the righteous is of the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Amen. God... This morning is our strength. Now let me reflect on some verses that perhaps you haven't considered. Life is short. And the life was short for Adam, my great grandson. I never held him, I never looked upon him. Never was able to play with him. God reminds us concerning life through James chapter 4, verse 14. He says, Whereas you know not what shall be on tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. I looked at that verse and I looked at the phrase vanisheth away. And it means this, to snatch out of sight, to put out of view, to make unseen. So we look at this passing, and do we see or say that God is heartless? Do we say to ourselves, well, God, why? He's young. But a child. Isn't it only the old that pass? But why was this 
child snatched out of our sight? Why was he put out of view? Why was he made unseen to us? And God reminds us, but he is not unseen in heaven. As he was released from this earth to know the beauty and the bliss of heaven that Jesus said only a few would find. That's right. Let me say that again. Adam is not unseen to God. He's not unseen in heaven. And I don't know what form he has. And I will show you a verse that you probably have never read or seen before in this context, in a few moments. I don't know how his stature is in heaven. I don't know if he's a baby. I don't know if God has given him full development. I don't know. I look through a glass darkly as you do. But I do know this, and I'm assured of this by the word of God. And you will also be assured that he is not unseen in heaven. But he has been released from this earth to know the beauty and the bliss of heaven that Jesus said only a few would find. And he has found it. Listen, he has found it. The Bible says, whereas you know not what shall be tomorrow, for what is your life? It's a vapor that appeareth for a little time. What does that verse mean? Appeared for a little time. It means to bring forth into the light, to cause to shine for a season. His light shined momentarily on this side of the river. His light shined momentarily. But here's what God is saying to us this morning. His light shined briefly on this side of heaven, but it shines and will shine as brightly as the stars shine in the sky forever. Consider that. Amen. That his light will shine, shine as brightly, eternally, as the stars in heaven shine from the sky to remind us that there is an eternity somewhere. He is now and forevermore eternally with God. Listen to that. He is now and forevermore eternally with God. Amen. Some might say, is God cruel? Why would God take a, a little one? I want you to consider what Solomon, the wisest man, said. In Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 1, people ask me a question sometimes, and they say, Reverend or pastor or chaplain, can you tell me why that little one passed? And I search for answers. Because sometimes you just want to give something to someone to hold on to. They could bring hope to their heart. Solomon said this in the message version. He said in Ecclesiastes 401, he said, next I turn my attention to all the outrageous violence that takes place on this planet. The tears of the victims, no one to comfort them, the iron grip of oppressors, no one to rescue the victims from them. So I congratulated the dead who are already dead instead of the living who are still alive. Wow, wait a minute. Solomon, what are you saying? The wisest man in the world wrote Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. The wisest man who roamed with God in the garden of flowers and different things and received all of this from the Lord one day wakes up and writes these words under the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know what he's saying? He's saying this child will never know violence. This child will never be a victim. This child will never come under the grips of an oppressor. This child right. has been released 
from what some of us might experience in our lifetime before our death. Solomon is saying, sure it's sad. Sure it's sad when a child passes. But Solomon is trying to say to us, but look on the other side. Look what this child will never experience as a human being on this earth. Look at the pain that God has relieved that child from. Look at the grief and the sorrow. And sometimes this concept is hard to wrap around your mind. But I believe that's exactly what Solomon is saying. He's saying he will never have to experience what millions of other people have experienced and will experience in their lifetime. So the question this morning is this, what must we do in the face of this sorrow and grief and adversity? 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 12 says, Now abide with faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Verse 12. Verse 13 says, in the message version, it says, But for right now, for right now, the best that we could do is receive the comfort of the Lord. The best that we can do is speak into each other's spirit and pray for one another and hug one another and love one another. But Paul said, for right now, until that completeness, until we're completed, until we no longer look through a glass darkly, until that time comes when we see him face to face and each other, Amen. until that completeness, we have three things to do to lead us toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. Amen. So let me give you those three things this morning. Trust steadily. What does that mean? It means to trust God progressively and increasingly as the days go by. It's not always easy to do that. It's not always easy to put your hand in the hand of God and say, God, walk me through this sorrow and grief. But God is saying trust steadily, progressively, and increasingly. And hope unswervingly, which means without wavering. Be steadfast in your hope. Don't be unshakable in your hope. Because there is hope in God. And he says to love extravagantly. Which means generously, lavishly, and excessively. What is God saying to us? God is saying one life has been completed on this side. But that life will be forever on the other side. Amen. We have work to do. Amen. We have people to comfort. We have people to hold, to pray for. We have people that are going to need us in their time of grief and sorrow. And as we experience the progressive healing of God, because it will not come in a day or two or three, It's a process. It's a progression. And sometimes it's a frustration to try to rid ourselves of grief and sorrow that only God can consume for us. So I looked at a verse in the Bible. And this verse said it all to me in this sermon that would bring hope to your soul and to mine. It's not that we doubt God or we don't believe in the Bible. It's not that we doubt where Adam is this morning. But sometimes you need that extra assurance. You need just a little something that God will speak to your heart to give you that boost, that hope, that encouragement. I looked at Samuel chapter 12 and verse 23. This was concerning the child of Bathsheba. David had prayed and he fasted. And the baby died. Listen carefully. It says, but now he is dead. David said, wherefore shall I fast? David fasted for a number of days, hoping, 
praying that their baby would live. But the baby died. And here's what David, the king, said. Can I bring him back again? A question. He's saying this to his servants. He said these words. Listen carefully. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. That's right. See what that says? What was David saying? This is a baby. This, this is a child that died. A child. What is David saying? I shall go to him. This is his hope. This was his faith. But he shall not return to me. But I will go to him. What's he saying? He was saying this in eternity for this child. You think just for this child? David is saying, this is my hope. That one day I will see this child. That one day I will see his face. But he will not come back to me. So what's the question that we need to ask ourselves this morning? Adam cannot come back to us. But we can go to him. And that's why Matthew reminds us in the Bible in Matthew 7 and verse 13 when he says these words, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go thereat. But look at verse 14. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few be there that find it. It behooves us to serve God. It behooves us to strive toward the Lord. It behooves us to hunger for His presence and thirst for his voice speaking to our heart and our soul and our spirit. Amen. We have to go there. Amen. We have to go there. And the only way that we can go there is through the blood of the Lamb. Okay. Through the shed blood of Christ. <clears throat> And through the finished work of the cross. Amen. And until then, as I close, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 reads, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. One life has concluded on this side, but continues for eternity. Our lives continue as Christians, as a mom, and as a dad, as a family, as a church. Our lives continue. And we must trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not unto our own understanding because we can ask a lot of questions. There's a lot of perplexities. There's a lot of things that we don't know or understand. But God is saying this, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. There's no easy answers other than what God shows us in the word. And my hope is that this morning we can find hope in the passing of a son, of a grandson, and a great-grandson. That one day, we will all be together. That one day, we will see the shine upon God's face and the shine that he will put upon ours Amen. for eternity. Amen. Adam is as the brightest star in the sky this morning and will be forever shining before the Lord. That's right. As I said, in what capacity, I don't know. A baby? A man? Fully grown? I don't know. But as much as God loved children, as much as Jesus held them to his bosom, as much as he said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, I have to believe 
that we will see children and babies in heaven. That's just my opinion. You have to come to your own conclusions concerning that. So, Father, we thank you for your love, your comfort, your hope. We do realize that we look through a glass darkly, there's no doubt. Yes, we have questions. Yes, we have questions. We don't know all the answers to. One day we will. Until that time, Lord, I pray that you keep us and guard us. As the psalmist said, keep me as the apple of thy eye and hide me under the shadow of thy wings. I pray, God, for my granddaughter and for her husband, that you would bring them to the skirts of your garment and hide them. <clears throat> I pray for our entire family, that you would bring us to the skirts of your garment and hide us and watch over us as the watchman that you are. I thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy that you have provided. And for those, Lord, that have supported, Lord, this situation and circumstance that has happened to our family. Thank you for the friends that we have and for those that have prayed in many places. We thank you for each and every one. And we pray your blessings upon them for their support. We thank you for this church and the support of brothers and sisters in Christ that will come to us and drop everything that's going on in their life to come and comfort those that are grieving and are in sorrow. We thank you for them. And we pray, God, that we will trust you for our future, knowing that you are in control and in charge of our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.